Are we, are we rolling? We're rolling. We're good. You know, technically this is take one still. Mm, that's true. It doesn't count as a cut. When we didn't cut it. When we didn't cut it. We just were going on so long that the camera shut off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's more of a mechanical failure than a presenter. It's not failure. against us. No. It's not against us. Okay. So we're good. Let's try this one. Take 1.5. Take 1.5. I like that. Okay. <laughs> Hit it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Apologetics 101. I'm still Regis O'Neill. He's still Father Federico. And we are so excited to talk to you guys about a topic that we've both been pretty passionate about over the past couple of weeks, Father. Big stuff, Regis. We've been chatting about it around the office, so let's just dive right into it here. Field trip edition. We're here in the church. That's right. We want the tabernacle to be a special part of this episode because right. this is all about Jesus in the real presence. And this whole discussion of Jesus in the Eucharist kicked off with a tweet from famous celebrity atheist Richard Dawkins. Yes, and I'm not being rude pulling out my phone. I'm going to read it verbatim to you guys because it's important to understand our Let's discussion see what he here. said. So, Richard Dawkins tweeted, Roman Catholics are required to believe that communion wine actually is literally the blood of Christ, and the wafer literally is his body. Not symbolically, but literally. Not a metaphor, but literally. That way madness lies. At the very least, it's a pernicious abuse of language. Okay, Richard Dawkins doing his Richard Dawkins thing, mm -hmm. hating on religion. In this case, uh, the, the Catholic practice of belief in the real presence that the Eucharist is not a symbol of Jesus, but it's actually Jesus. But Regis, he's got some truth in there. Absolutely. Some of the things he says are true. Just about everything aside from those last two lines yeah. is the truth of our faith, the truth of our faith. Um, the tweet was not what was the issue for me. No. And it wasn't what was the issue for a lot of people. Um, what I, what really disheartened me uh, were the replies to the tweet because the good thing was there was a lot of Catholics coming to the church's defense against this attack by Richard Dawkins. He's got three million followers, so there's a <laughs> lot of conversation afterwards. Exactly. Big Twitter versus debate. debate. Um, but the bad news is that they were coming to his defense in a really disappointing way. Heartbreaking way. Heartbreaking is the right word for it. Basically, there was a lot of Catholics coming and saying to Richard Dawkins, that is not what we no, believe. No, we don't really believe that. It's a symbol. It's a metaphor. Nobody ever taught me that it was the real thing. My priest even doesn't believe that. Absolute gut punch. Heartbreaking that so many well-meaning Catholics either did not believe or have not been taught the single most important doctrine of what it means to be Catholic. Right. What the church calls the source and summit of the Christian life, that the Eucharist is Jesus, mm -hmm. not a symbol of Jesus. So logically, Regis, there's only two options. Either Jesus Christ is a liar, mm -hmm. and Richard Dawkins is correct, and the Catholic Church has been perpetuating the biggest hoax in human history for Ever. the last two millennia. Mm -hmm. Either all those things are true, or Jesus was telling the truth when he said, this is my body, mm -hmm. it's actually me. They both can't be true, so we as Catholics have to decide what we believe. Because we read a study recently that shows 70% of Catholics do not believe in the real presence. But maybe if you're watching this video, you're among the 30% who do believe, which, good job, four thumbs up from us. <laughs> but if we do believe what the church teaches, and we do believe Jesus is telling the truth, right. why do we act like Richard Dawkins in church? Yeah, that's, that's the key point here. And so we thought that a great idea would be to share with you guys our five best practical tips for having our actions, causing our actions to fall in line with what we believe as Catholics, which is that that is Jesus in there in the tabernacle whenever that red candle is lit. The same Jesus Christ who you, God willing, will meet face to face in heaven, the same person, mm. the same God man, the same son of God, mm is in there right now. Hmm. Not any dim diminished version of him, not some, the, the Eucharist is not a piece of holy bread. Sure. The Eucharist is the living God himself. So we have five practical tips that, as Regis said, can bring our behavior, especially in church, in line with what we believe up here, but maybe not always act it out in here. So Regis, practical tip number one has to do with our knees. Yes, practical tip number one is an ancient Catholic practice that has fallen a little bit out of favor in the past couple of centuries. A lot of people still do it, praise God, but it's something that we can all do to help remind ourselves that 
This is the Lord's house and he lives right there. The practice is called genuflection and it's the simple act of kneeling facing the tabernacle when you enter the church, like so. Now that does two things. Number one, that reminds us that we are entering a holy place, a sacred place, a place where the Lord is. And secondly, it shows some reverence, some respect, and some deference to the Lord, the King of the universe, who is Who's sitting right there. In that golden box, that tabernacle right now, and walking past the tabernacle or walking around the church without ever stopping to acknowledge Jesus with a genuflection mm. is akin to saying, I don't believe in the real presence. Mm. There's not God in that box. So why would I go out of my way? Now, if you have trouble genuflecting or kneeling, uh, the church invites you to make a reverent bow or even a nod of the head. It doesn't matter so much what you do, it's the spirit with which we do it. Absolutely. How about practical tip number two, Regis? Tip number two comes after you have received the Eucharist at Mass. You know, I, I will admit I have fallen into this it trap. It happens, it happens. Many a times you get, you know, you receive the Eucharist, you go back, you sit in the pew, and you take a look up and say, oh, look look how she's receiving communion. Maybe that's not it. Oh, look, there, there's my friend Jared. I wonder if we can hang out later after the soccer game. What time is the game on? Is uh, that, you know, let me check my watch. What are we having for lunch? And then the next thing you know, you're gone. You just received communion, you go back to your pew, and it becomes a, an absent-minded, people-watching drift session. Right. Instead of Regis, the most intimate, powerful moment you could ever have on this side of eternity. That's right. We will never have a better opportunity to dialogue and to pray to the Lord than when we have him physically present within us in the form of the Eucharist. So it's a great opportunity to, and what our second tip is, is to take a moment and say a prayer of gratitude, of thanksgiving. That is, of course, mm. what the, Eucharist the means. The word Eucharist means thanksgiving. Mm. So maybe it's asking us to go back to our seat and thank <laughs> God for what has just happened, that the God of the universe has humbled himself to come into our body and clean us from the inside out. I think a little prayer of thanks. And there's so many available, either sure. something that you make up in your heart or, or ones that you can find in, in the church's long tradition. Absolutely. How about practical tip number three? Practical tip number three is something that I've tried to practice over the past couple of years of my life, especially, and it's really done wonders for me in my faith journey. And that is considering whether or not you're prepared to receive the Eucharist, and most importantly, accepting that there are times that we're not. This is a, a bit of pain or contention for some people. The church very clearly teaches that if I am in a state of mortal sin, unrepentant mortal sin, I am not to receive the Eucharist. And it sounds like, oh, the church is being so harsh and, and judgmental, but in reality, Regis, mm. it's actually a tremendous act of mercy. Absolutely. What, what the church is trying to you know, foment in our lives with this teaching is to save us from greater sin. Think about it. If we're in a state of sin, a state of mortal sin, which is essentially saying, I am willfully distancing myself from God, and then we receive God into our bodies, there is a disconnect. It's a contradiction. There. Absolutely. It's, it's, we're, we're, we're taking the holiest thing in the universe, Jesus Christ, and bringing him into ourselves when we have acted in such a way as to say, I don't want you here. Being in a state of mortal sin is the voluntary, intentional severing of my relationship with God, and receiving the Eucharist is the most God indwelling moment of a person could possibly have. Yes. And those two things don't go together. Plus, St. Paul says, he who eats and drinks the body of Christ without discerning Brings heaps condemnation. condemnation upon himself. The church doesn't use this language very often. If we receive the Eucharist in a state of mortal sin, we're not adding grace to ourselves. We're heaping condemnation. And the church wants to spare us from that region. There is hope, however. If you, you are still encouraged to attend Mass, of even course. if you are not prepared to receive the Eucharist, and you are not a second-class participant, not, not at all. you are invited to come forward during communion, while you're recommended to not receive the Eucharist, you may simply come in front of the priest, cross your arms like this, and he will give you a blessing. Fire off a blessing. Boom. And of course, you could go to confession. Ooh! Get out of a state of mortal sin and then come back to full reception of the Eucharist. That sounds like a that good That works point. pretty good too. Yeah. How about practical tip number four? Practical tip number four has to do with before we even come to the Mass mm -hmm. itself. Preparing ourselves for the Mass. And there are a number of different ways to do this. One of the ones that I found most effective is just coming to Mass at a time where it's not squeezed in between mm. a couple of things. If I've got soccer practice at one o'clock, maybe I'm not gonna come to the noon Mass and get right out of there right after communion. Maybe I'll come to the 10.30 where I know I'll have a little bit more time to maybe dress up a little bit, 
be more prayerful, reflective, and truly participate. Now, there's another way that you can prepare yourself for the Mass, specifically about an hour or so beforehand. Mm. Father, why don't you share with us about that? I think you should come to church hungry. The mm. church asks us to come to church having participated in what's called the Eucharistic fast, and we've done a video on this. Yeah, the Eucharistic about. fast, when we intentionally dis deny ourselves food for one hour, mm. is not a huge thing. Mm. What, what we like to generate is a little symbolic hunger to show that when I come into these doors, I'm here to receive the body of Christ from this table. Notice the food motif. The Last Supper was a meal. We come to share in that meal with a little symbolic hunger because I'm not here to be fed physically. A nice slice of pizza will do that. <laughs> I'm here to be fed with, the, with Jesus himself, the body of Christ. When you eat healthy food, what do you become? Healthier. When you eat unhealthy food, what do you become? Not as healthy. When you eat holy food, what do you become? Holy? holy. Practical tip number five, Regis. Practical tip number five is something that Father and I are passionate about because we're both communications guys. Mm. So language is important. And when we discuss the Eucharist, it is really important to us to refer to the Eucharist as the body and blood of Christ. Think about it. You're around the dinner table on a Sunday afternoon and you were saying, oh, Mass was great this morning. Um, you know, that part when the priest uh, uh, fumbled with the bread and then he spilled the wine a little bit. You know, when we reference the Eucharist in conversation outside Mass, whatever it is, whatever right. reason, we only refer to unconsecrated bread right. as bread. Mm and wine that has not been consecrated as wine. Right. We, just, we refer to the consecrated elements only as the body and blood of Christ. Because they look like bread and they look like wine, taste and smell like it, but they are no longer bread and wine. They retain the outside appearance of this, right. but they're Jesus himself. So we can't act like they're just bread and wine anymore and we shouldn't refer to them as bread and wine anymore. Absolutely. There's a, there is a distinct moment where they cease to be mere bread and wine, and they become fully the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives right there. Again, folks, either Richard Dawkins is correct, and this is all madness, this is all a hoax, and Jesus Christ is a liar, or Jesus was telling the truth when he said that simple, straightforward sentence, this is my body. Amen. The only question is, what are we gonna do about it? Mm. Regis, will you join me? I will. Let's do it, let's do it. Syllogism? Did we just do that? Nice. Boom. Let's finish this off. Practical tip number five. Which I don't remember, so Father's going to share with us. <laughs> like, do you want to take that over? Yeah, let's think yeah, of what okay. our practical tip was. <laughs> I'm going through the form like, crap, what is it? What is it? Yeah. Eucharistic fast, prepare yourself. Saying amen, wasn't it? Um, what? Receive the host carefully. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Consume it immediately. Mm -hmm. Extra attention during the uh, consecration. Shoot!